gran misericordia, oh de amor sublime don, plenitud de vida eterna, prenda de perdón, prenda vida de giving all praise to God for that and I just every time I hear in our church applause I know where it's going to it's so cool all right 30 day supplication for missions if you haven't gotten one of these and you'd like to have one I know most everybody does pastor Michael why don't you come uh brother I'll tell you what brother Christopher why don't you come and hand these out to anybody that wants one I know again like I say I know that many of you already have one but this is just a way to pray. You say, what is this about, Pastor? Well, it's to resolve for us to pray, to give ourselves some resolution on this. God, would you really cause me to focus on missionaries? Would you really cause me to focus on missionary letters? Would you really cause me to focus on, Savior, what you would have us do in Sussex County? How many of you know Sussex County is missions? You know? How many of you know that when Brother Garrett starts the church in Millsboro, if the Lord allows, that's missions. Do we understand that? Do we understand that the fellow up in Philadelphia that's doing the deaf ministry, that's missions. That the Jewish folks in Tennessee that are benefiting from our missionary there, that's missions, right? And then after that, Savior, would you show me where to resolve in the United States? Reveal to me the needs in the United States for surrendered missionaries, prayer and sacrificial giving. And then, Prince, please touch our world. What is this? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's what the scriptures tells us. Our missions, okay? So, my Prince, touch the world missions fervently. My Lord, help me to understand what you want in my involvement, prayer, and in my monetary giving. I know the Lord will bless you as you look. Go with me, if you will. Just grab your Bible and go right over to uh, Mark, where we started today. Mark chapter 8. What do you see today in our church, this morning? Do you miss some families? Do you miss the horsemen? All the kids are sick, every one of them, this morning, okay? Do you miss, uh, let's see, who else was missing last? Well, Christopher, you're here today. I was thinking about you on Wednesday night. We never thought of like, I, I thought of like 30 other people we didn't mention in the service that were missing. This time of the year decided to extend itself rather than just a weekend. It's been two or three weeks. Uh, Brother Lou, what did you tell me before the service? How long have you been sick? Uh, forever. Yeah, <laughs> feels like, doesn't it? I'm just glad some of you are testing well and that there's no problems with COVID in the building. I'm grateful for that. But boy, I'll tell you, it was yucky for a little while. I think we're on the very tail end of it now, I really do, but some people still staying out to be safe. Uh, you'll notice that the boroughs aren't here because one of them actually just has a sore throat, but they don't know what it is, and so they don't want to make any of you sick. Sign-ups with the college kids. You'll see them outside in just a little bit. Some of them are interns, so hey, tonight, one of our interns is preaching, okay? It's Alicia Hale's favorite person. Huh? Huh? Oh, that's right. He's in Pennsylvania. We all look alike. We all look alike. He says, okay. Uh, <laughs> that was unreasonable. Unreasonable and unholy. Okay. Isaac Valdez is going to be taking the pulpit this evening. He will tell you some about his internship and what the Lord's doing in his life. And he'll also give you the word of God, pure and simple. March Madness meal on Sunday evening. There is a sign up for that. Love letters, my wife, tutoring snack this Sunday sign up. We'll talk more with you about that probably this evening. Evangelism. Quite a few are going on evangelism now. You know what I'm noticing? People are branching out. Beverly, thank you so much for the work you've done this week. I praise the Lord for the hails. 
I praise the Lord for several families. My daughter even abandoned us and went and went somewhere else. Isaac and I abandoned the group and went somewhere else. I see what's going on with our regular attending groups. We're just going everywhere, and that's fine to have groups all over the city. How many of you know it's good to have groups all over the city doing the same job? And if you're in there doing it, bless the Lord for you. I thank God for that. All right, so today's title is real simple. I, I, I wonder, you know, I had a lady, a young lady uh, who was in church here a little while ago, told me she had covid and she had something odd happen to her taste. What, what usually happens to those who have COVID uh, and their taste? Who, what, what happens usually? Over, over here, yes. What is it? Did you lose yours for a while? Yeah? I'm just glad you didn't lose your mind, Tom. We can live with taste, right? Yeah. <laughs> he looks at me as if to say, how do you know I didn't, Pastor? Maybe I did. I've been praying for Tom and Norma Jean. I've been praying so hefty for you. I love you so much. I'm so glad you're here. Did you have to hobble in? A little bit, yeah. You know, my friends, that's going on all over. It's not just COVID. It's sicknesses of every kind. But this young lady that came and visited us about two months ago was sitting with me during the meal time at Christmas time. All right? And she said to me, my situation was different from everybody else's. When I had my anomaly with my taste, everything sa- tasted like garbage. Yeah. Everything tasted like... She said, the taste intensified past where it was, there was a palpable taste anymore. And she said, every piece of food in my mouth tasted like trash. And over the next, she she got, she actually had COVID about a year before, from what I understand, and she's still going through that. And then I met her there two months ago. If I'm getting this timeline wrong, and some of you are listening, you know who that is, forgive me. But she did have this problem, this thing that happened. And she told me this, she said, I've lost 40 pounds because I don't want to eat food. I just don't want to eat. I have to hold my nose to actually put the food in my mouth. I don't know. I don't know. I imagine it's the same with water even, maybe. I don't know. But you know you can taste water a little bit? How many of you know that? The title of today's message is this. Getting a taste for missions. Getting a taste for missions. Letting it break your heart. Letting it get down deep into you. Looking at verse 27, Jesus went out his disciples in the town of Caesarea Philippi. And you saw this whole thing read already. He said, who do people say I am? Hey, can I ask you, Tom, who do people say that Jesus was? Who did they say he was? What things did they say? Elias, a prophet. What else? John the Baptist. So let me ask you this. Today, who are people saying Jesus is? Just a prophet. Just a prophet. That's right. Muslims, what do they say? Uh, Muslims, what do they say? That he's just a prophet, right? What? Just a good man. man. Can I tell you something? I'm going to make this clear to you. I believe in revival. I believe that across the world there are some bona fide revivals going on where businesses are shutting down where people who are vending alcohol are stopping to do that, where others have given themselves wholly to the Lord and that even their own substance abuse issues have changed. They themselves have stopped lying, stopped stealing, stopped illicit sexual behavior. But then there are those revivals where that's not happening. Do you understand that? What's a real revival? Repentance. Repentance. Real life change. Jesus said this, Ye shall know them by their... What does that mean? The results. Their fruit. What they produce. You understand? So when I look at what I think to be a bona fide revival, it's going to be bang time, huge change. But when things are business as usual... How many of you think that's real revival? You know, 
way back when Jonathan Edwards preached his sermon on sinners of an, in the hands of an angry God, people left that meeting, that building, with lives that were changed. They left in that moment deciding that they were going to do right. It didn't take a month before great things started to take place all over that area, and it spread all over the place. You say, now, Pastor, why is it that you're telling me that? Because you know what? Sometimes revival doesn't taste like you and I think it should. Revival tastes bitter rather than sweet. And we're all just like, kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya, you know. It might be sweet to raise your hands and goof around and have a little emotional, nice time. But my friends, when brass tacks, when it comes down to brass tacks, and we really want to see change, God's going to do some massive things. When I was in Uruguay, there's this thing called mate. How many of you have heard of it? Okay, mate. Do you know what mate is? Do you know Martin? No. Los de Nicaragua no toman el mate, no? Those in Nicaragua don't, don't drink mate, right? <laughs> no, it's not cake coffee. Mate. A, a café te gusta, no? Es así. You see, everybody has to have coffee, right? That's just how it is. Uh, but anyway, mate was like four times stronger than coffee. And it came in what was generally used as a gourd. And there was a metal straw with it. You put that metal straw. Now, mate is just nothing but tea. It's just a leaf off of a tree, okay? I tell you what. You drink that stuff, and immediately our tongues, American citizens, generally want to spit it out, all right? Where did that come from? That's disgusting, right? Don't put that in my mouth again. That's gross, you know? All your taste buds with little shovels are saying, get that out. You know what I'm saying? Now, I took mate for the first time in Uruguay, and this is, my, this is my response. You tell me how it was. Okay, this is how it is for me. Maybe for you, this is what happens sometimes too when somebody tells you to try something. You say, <laughs> right? What am I doing? Well, I'm lying through my teeth. Just I my nod my head. But it was disgusting. It was disgusting. And it didn't take me three months before I was drinking that stuff like it was milk. I mean, it was just fantastic. And to this day, you set a mate in front of me, it's going to be gone. All right? It's going to be gone. I love mate. But it took me a good little while, three months, to get used to it. Now, here's the deal. With missions, it may take you some time to get used to it. You know, when we start out with missions, we say, oh, yeah, a little something to give to them. Here's $3 for that sweet little need, you know. Well, that'll take a missionary about a half a day to spend. And then the rest of his life, he's going to die, you know. <laughs> so what is the idea of missions? Well, I want you to think for just a second with what the Bible says. As you're looking at Mark chapter 8, at the very end in verse 33, he tells Satan... Get him behind him, not Peter, but Satan. For you, Satan, savor not the things that be of God. Can I tell you that revivals that involve Antichrist, Satan isn't savoring what is good. He's savoring and causing Christians to savor things that are evil. In other words, any lifestyle that you're leading any attitude that you have that it's against God, hey, listen, it's okay. You just go ahead and live that way. Go ahead and keep living that way. Jesus just wants you to come to Him. You don't have any need for change. I'm not saying to you that Christians are perfect. That would be Lordship salvation. I don't subscribe to that. But what I am saying is this. If you truly get saved, you're going to know it. And when you truly get saved... You begin to want things that you didn't want before, and you begin to not want things that you used to want. That's just natural. Why? Tell me why. Huh? Holy the Holy Spirit of God comes, starts to convict, and especially right at the beginning, woo, He comes with a fervor, and He starts to show us what's wrong, and He starts to show us wrong behavior. Understand what happened before this. 
Look with me, if you will, at Mark chapter 8 and verse 14. Mark chapter 8, just flip over a few verses to verse 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, all right? Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, and he said this, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, and they reasoned among themselves, and they said, How? He's mad because we didn't take bread. It is because we forgot the bread. He's starting to talk about leaven. He's starting to talk about what is representative of sin because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew this, he said unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand how ye ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not, having ears hear ye not. Do ye not remember when I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of the fragments took ye up? How many were there? That's what they said. They say unto him, twelve. Now what were these baskets? Well, they were about this big, right? I think these were huge baskets. I believe they were representative of what the time period considered a basket, okay? It was rather large. And there were twelve of them. Now get this. And when the seven among four thousand had many baskets full of fragments. How many? The seven that were, and and they said, pardon me. When the seven among four thousand had many baskets full of fragments took you up. How many baskets took you up? They said seven. And he said unto them, how is it that you do not understand? Now what was Jesus trying to get at? You tell me. Exactly. What else? That's exactly it. What else? Oh, that's great, honey. What else? Well, look up here for just a second. Let me tell you. What this means for First Baptist Church is he never has and never will need your grudgingly given money. Okay? He never has and never will need your grudgingly given money. All right? He will take care of his church. He's proven me that fact for 36 years in ministry. And I have watched people come and go. I've watched money come and go. I've watched individuals come and go. And I thought, oh, wow. They, I bet you, you know, and they will tell me. A lot of times people just say it to me. I'm giving so much. I I think, oh, man, that person's leaving. And the next week, they'll be double. It happens all the time. You know who takes care of the living church of God? God. So guess what, you guys? God has all the bread that He will ever need. Okay, yeah, we're seeing bread physically here, but I'm talking about bread, baby. You know what I mean? He got all the bread He ever needed. All right? There's plenty of bread to go around. Look at Psalm 50, if you will. Psalm 50. Psalm 50 and verse 10. This is a great text. I'd like to read this together. This is good. Psalm 50 and verse 10. Psalm 50 and verse 10. Read that with me. Ready? Here we go. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Go to verse 11, if you will. I know all the fowls of the mountains. And the wild beasts of the field are mine. Verse 12 says this. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Now, if you tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor, you're wrong. I just got to tell you, you just fly out wrong. That's funny to me. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Okay, I thought that was good. Look at me if you will at Psalm 24, verse 1. Psalm 24 <laughs> and verse 1. Wherever it is that you see God putting his stamp of approval on a thing, it's a good thing. Look at this. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. You know what? He puts his stamp of approval on you. He loves you. You belong to him. It says you to USDA God on your forehead. You know what I'm saying? All right, so look at verse 2, if you will. 
Uh, For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods, look at verse 3, if you will. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Verse 4. He that hath what? Clean hands and a pure heart. What is he looking for? No. He says, listen, for entry, you need $1,000. No. No, he just made clear he doesn't need a thing from you. What he desires is clean hands and a pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. These are the things that he wants. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for people who will take up their cross. People who will be ready to bleed. People who will be ready to bleed. What does that mean? What does it mean? That he wants people who are ready to bleed. Does that mean? I'm not talking about sadomasochism. I'm saying being ready to die for the cause of Christ. How many of you are ready to die for the cause of Christ? How many of you are ready for, to die? If someone came and put a gun to your head, are you ready to die for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll never get an image out of my head. It's been there for years. There was a movie that I saw way back, like 25 years ago. And it was a picture. It, was it that? I think it was that long ago. It was, it was a film with a family in the Colosseum. How many of you know what I mean when I say in the Colosseum? In the Colosseum. Okay. So the Colosseum was where they would throw Christians into this Colosseum to the lions. And those lions would be released and they would rip those Christians apart. And the image of this film had several Christians in the Colosseum in groups, okay? So that they could be entertained. Do we get this now? I'm going to give you this progression. I don't want to get off the subject, but I am going to give you this progression before we go through these three points very rapidly. But number one, I want you to get this. God doesn't need anything. What he's looking for, what he desires, is for us to be ready to bleed for him. To die for him. In this film, they released those lions. And instead of what you would think, that they would rush out and run to them and just start devouring them, I think it was almost a little bit more realistic than that. Because what what I saw was, these lions that were released roamed around the outside of this family. They walked around. And you know what it made me think of, don't you? It made me think of how that lions do what? They roam around, do, they, they, they se- seek who they can devour. That's what, yeah. They look at, uh, who, who are weak? Who are, yeah. And so they were praying, these little children, The mother and the father were sitting there praying in the Colosseum. And this lion's just roaming, roaming, roaming. And then he kind of made a turn, almost like a a shark. And he turned in. And I don't know if they did this with CGI or what. But he turned in and the mother of the family was sitting there praying. And this lion's mouth was huge. And it just covered up her shoulder. And his mouth went right up into her shoulder like this. And he grabbed a hold of her and they cut the scene. I'll never forget that for as long as I live. And I think to myself, how many of us are ready for that? Can I tell you this? When lying no longer is a problem, when stealing no longer is a problem, and then we get to a point where even the extremely disgusting and perverted behavior of the LGBTQ community becomes normal, the next step is what happened in the Colosseum and what happened with Hitler. What they did was, everyone that were murderers that had the murder gene, poor little people that have the murder gene, we need to give them someone to kill. They need to have somebody to kill. This is the next step. 
And who do you think they're going to put out there for the poor little murder gene people to kill? We're already at a point. It's not just legislation anymore. It's being run through that now it's okay for little boys to love on grown men. It's already becoming okay. I'm telling you the next steps are to normalize murderers and say, well, they need someone to kill. Just like Hitler did. Who was Hitler's army made up of? Murderers. And he knew who they were. Trained murderers. People who loved to murder. People who enjoyed it. People who didn't do it like Americans had to do. Where they still suffer PTSD because they had to do some of the things that they did. But these people enjoyed it. They enjoyed it. And they killed Jews for a living. And you think that that was just something in history that will never repeat itself? I got news for you, it will repeat itself. And in this nation, we're about headed to that. We're about to a point where the next step is to say, okay, let's just go ahead and throw those Christians out there. What does the Bible say in Revelation will happen in the very last days? We'll be beheaded. Who do you think will be doing the beheaded? Oh, those poor ones with the murder genes. They need someone to kill. Do you understand how sick our society has become? Gay behavior is disgusting. It is perverted. And no one wants to say it because 90% of what you see on TV would make you think that about 95% of us are gay. We've gotten to a point where we accept this kind of behavior. We accept the lying. We accept the stealing. We accept these things as if they're norms. We accept and even, listen close, respect those who do not worship the one true God. Where did we ever get to a point where the Bible says to respect them? We don't respect those who do not believe in the living God. We love them. We're concerned for them. But to respect their way of thinking is not biblical. What is to be had is this understanding. I cannot respect that. Because the Word of God speaks of one true God. And anything that would be respectful to anything but Him is wrong. I will bow my knees to the one true God of heaven. Get this. As I get my musical interlude here, very nice. Okay. Very good, very good. By the way, shut your cell phones off. Okay. Number one, God has no need of my prayer. You say, wait a minute, He does. God is, God, my friends, is all powerful. Your prayer does not strengthen Him. Now, if you're talking about the God Zeus, yes. He's strengthened by praise and prayer. Our God is not strengthened by praise and prayer. Jesus Christ said it this way. Hey, you don't want to praise God? It's okay. He's going to get the rocks to cry out to Him. Because our God is God of everything. He's not our puppy dog. He's the God of all things. So He doesn't need our prayer. God needs us to go into all the... No, He doesn't. God doesn't need you to go into all the world. God desires it. God loves it when you do. God's plan is based on it. God will have His way, but He doesn't need that. Wait a minute, though. He needs my money. No, He does not. I have a need to pray. I have a need to go. I have a need to give. I have those needs. God, He doesn't need anything. Exodus 25 and verse 2, if you will. Look at what Moses was told. Exodus 25 and verse 2. This is what Moses was told about this. He said this. Listen, I want you, Moses, I want you to talk to the Israelites, speaking to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Now this was the tithes, right? No. What was this, Keith? Right. 
So how would you term this? Missions or building fund? <laughs> this is actually the missions. This is actually the building fund. Why do you say that? Well, you look at the rest of the verse in its context. Right, yeah. And they were bringing things. Not just money, but things. These offerings were diamonds and gold and brass and all kinds of furs and all kinds of wood. Yeah, badger skins and that guy. How would you like to bring offerings like that? You see, our offering today is all this up here. You know what I'm saying? It's not just these little pieces of money that we're bringing. There's a whole big offering. So he says this in verse 2. Yeah, there you go. Good. Thank you for putting those up, brother. Thank you. But in verse 2, it says this. Every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. Okay, so tithes were like the law. That was the thing to do. Hey, this wasn't something we're asking. This is what, you're going to have some real issues if you don't give that. In fact, the Bible tells us that if we're robbing from Him, it's in tithes and offerings. We're robbing from Him and we withhold that. We say, well, I don't want it. You know what? When this entire congregation makes decisions, I believe the Holy Spirit is on those sacred decisions. I really do believe that. If it be that a church is heading the right direction, they're biblical, their decisions that they're making are being led of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know what? I'm not going to, man, I'm not going to de- destabilize my giving just for a pet project. I just won't do it. But here, he said, don't worry about it. Whoever gives, gives. Those that don't, won't be blessed. That's just how it is. So he says this, what? Of every man, what? That giveth it willingly. So ultimately, what is my job? It's to rub you the wrong way until you give. No. My job is to encourage the giving that's been given. And say, bless the Lord. God is doing good. God is doing awesome. Praise the Lord. He's using you. But also to reprove in those times when it's, when it's appropriate. To say, are you giving? Why are you giving, Jay? What's your reason for that, Brother Tom? What is the purpose, Earl? of your giving. My wife and I were called to Uruguay some years ago, and when we were called to Uruguay, I didn't want to go. Pastor, really? No, I didn't want to go. Are you kidding me? I was happy. I was the music and teen director at Pine Forest Estates Baptist Church in Cantonment, Florida. It was exciting to me. God was moving. Our little two or three people youth group had grown to 68 and it was con- continuing to grow this way back when uh, Moses still walked the earth and I was enjoying myself are you kidding me I was enjoying myself as brother Garrett says you're old man you're old <laughs> I own it I'm 53 how many of you know I'm a senior citizen at 53 no, 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 no. You got two years. oh two years? years okay praise the Lord for that I'm thanking you Jesus at that okay all right but I didn't want to go. You know who got a hold of me, took me into the house, sat me down, looked me in the eye, and spent hours and hours telling me, you need to go to the mission field. No one. No one. Let me ask you something. Should this preacher sit you down, sit down and talk with you and say, listen, if you're not giving the missions, let me get a hold of you for hours and hours and convince you to give. Is that my job? No. I'll tell you who will do it is the Holy Spirit and his preaching, his word, the Bible. The word of God is so convincing. Oh, man. So God has no need of your prayer, your going or your money. Number two, God has no need of my time. My attention or my vision. He has no need of my time, my attention, or my vision. But can I tell you this? I have need of giving my time. I have need of giving my attention. I have need of giving my vision to the Lord. You know what I think we need to do as a church? We need to go on a missions trip. How many of you know that? We need to go on a missions trip. All right, we're going to have to get several buses, okay? <laughs> Jeff O'Day is going to go with us down to Mexico. Hey, you say, Pastor, that's nonsensical. I, that, that ship sailed for me. Dad, how many people of a, of, a, 
of an older group went with us down to Uruguay? Thirteen of them. I tell you what, there's nothing wrong with travel today. You ain't going to have any problems. I'm telling you what. It's the truth. I mean, we'll put you in first class. You have any issues, but you'll have to pay for it. <laughs> Look with me at Lamentations 3 and verse 51, won't you? Lamentations 3 and verse 51. First, God has no need of my prayer going or money. God has no need of my time, attention, and vision. Lamentations 3.51 says, Mine eye affecteth my heart. Because of all the daughters in my city. Alicia, did your eye affect your heart? What's different for you since you went down to Mexico? I know that's probably not your first trip, but what differences were there from the time that you went until after that? I mean, after that moment. Yeah. It's much more than an emotional thing, isn't it? You gave part of yourself to them. They gave part of themselves to you. There's nothing like going on a good mission trip. Nothing like it in all the world. I've been to Brazil, Santiago, Vinales, Cuba, which is on the other side of the island. We were in Montevideo. We spent some time in the other parts of those other parts of Cuba where there weren't any hotels, no tourist attractions. We spent time, of course, you know, in Uruguay, blessings of going in different places just witnessing how people live you say oh they're all the same yeah they're not all the same all those folks are different one from another i tell you it's amazing when i first met barb i looked into those eyes of hers and all i saw was she's a little nerd you know <laughs> the first time i met her and she's she's a little nerd why would you know all these beautiful girls down in Pensacola. She's just, you know, she's just a little. It took the second time and the third time and the fourth time and talking with her and realizing who she was to realize there is no woman in the world that comes close. For me. <laughs> For me. But I got to tell you, no one even comes close. And now people, I've actually had a young man say to me in my office, Pastor, have you ever been tempted to leave your marriage? I know a lot of people are. A lot of people are, a lot of pastors are. But I could honestly say to him, man, my tastes are so specific. They're named Barbara Seacrest. I, I don't, it, it makes me ill to think of anybody. Can I fall? You better believe it. In a minute I could fall. And that scares me to death. It keeps me thinking all the time. Oh, God, help me. But I'm just saying to you, it's, my temptations are different from that. All right? I have them. Oh, man. But could I be tempted in that way? You better believe it. You better believe it. But the point is this. Look into the eyes of missions. Into the eyes of missionaries. Into the eyes of their children. Into the eyes of those who live in another country. And let your eye affect your heart. Number three and last this morning. God has no need of my fastings. God has fastings, pardon me. God has no need of my belief. God has no need of my faith. Wait a minute now. The Bible says without faith ye can do nothing. That's exactly right. But he doesn't need you. You need faith. You need belief. You need fastings. God has no need of my fastings, belief, and faith, but I need it. Look at Matthew 17, if you will, and this in closing. How many of you have a coin jar? At least 20 of you have coin jars. Wouldn't it be the coolest thing if we started corn jars for missions? Wouldn't that be a neat idea? Oh, just whatever I've got. I'm just gonna, you know what? I'm going to call that my missions jar. You know, my friends, faith and belief and what we call fastings can be represented in ideas, good ideas for how to save for missions, how to give for missions, how to give more time in prayer 
for missions, how to actually go on that mission trip. And it can be a coin jar. Look at verse 51 here. Not, oh, pardon me. I'm sorry. Uh, did I not tell you? I'm sorry. It's Matthew 17, 24, Richard. I didn't even tell you what it was, did I? Matthew 17, 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? They say, Now, Pastor, that can't be the right passage of Scripture. It is. It is. Just look with me for a second. Look at the next verse. He saith, Yes. And when he's coming to the house, I mean, he just talked for Jesus. Have any of you ever spoken for Jesus? Have any of you spoken up for Jesus, defend Jesus? Somebody will say, well, this and this and that about Jesus. Oh, yeah, well, Jesus said, blah, blah, blah. I got to defend him because he can't defend himself, poor little Jesus. That's what this is going on here. When he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him. What does that mean? He stopped him. Stopped him from what? I believe, first of all, this is Peter's house. It's just my personal thought on this. Don't say that I'm a reprobate or that I'm getting it wrong. I just maybe I haven't studied enough, but I think this is Peter's house. And he's getting ready to go and get his money. And he's getting ready to pay his tax. And Jesus prevented him. Stopped him. And he said, what thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? In verse 26, he says, Peter saith unto him of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free? Now look at verse 27. Notwithstanding. Now, here's what we just learned. Jesus, the king of the universe who made everything and creator of all things, didn't need to be paying anybody taxes. Second of all, those who followed him and were not a part of this nation or this citizenry in here in the United States or anywhere needed to pay taxes notwithstanding. Why do I pay my taxes? Well, not to go to jail, actually. But beside that, that word, notwithstanding, is why I pay my taxes. Right, Brother Hale? That word right there is why I pay my taxes, Brother Bob. Just notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. Now get this. I don't care much for communism at all. But our nation is gone communist. You know that, right? They really have. So no, it has it. Well, who here isn't taking government funding of any kind for anything? Okay, then we're communists, okay? You see what I'm saying? The fact is, if you're taking Social Security, we're on the dole. No, that's my money. Is it really? It was already spent a long time ago. Notwithstanding... Lest we should offend them, pay your taxes. Go thou to the sea, he said, cast an hook in, take up the fish that first cometh, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take and give unto them for, th for, th for me and thee. Pastor, I still don't see the connection to this in message, missions. Can I tell you what faith promise is? Faith promise is not budgeting your money so that you can give to faith promise. Faith promise is saying to God, Lord, by faith, if you will give me fish out, uh, money out of a fish's mouth, I will give it to missions. That's what it is. Have you ever thought about this, Brother O'Day? Think about this. Faith promise, according to the Scriptures, is saying to God, I have such faith in you that if you give me a figure to give every single month, $400, $600, $50, $15, Lord... I don't have it. I don't know how it's going to work. My budget isn't going to work out if I give it. But if you give it to me in some weird, miraculous way, and I see it, I will not keep it. I will put it in the offering plate. That's faith promise. And that is what you see here. What was Jesus doing with Peter? He was saying, hey, Peter, I'm going to show you what I'm capable of. I can give you the money to pay your taxes. How many of you know every time you pay your taxes, God gave you the money to pay your taxes? How many of you know every time you pay your faith promise, God gave you the money to pay your faith promise? So why are you doing anything else with it? He doesn't need your faith. He doesn't need your belief. 
He doesn't need us in the slightest. But he does desire for us to change. And you know what? We need, we need to pray, to go, to give our money, to give our time, to give our attention, to give our vision, to give our fasting, to give our belief, to give our faith. We need to do that. Clifford Clark, years ago, talked about a lady who was of a certain age, I think she's 79 years old, something like that. And she went and actually was on the mission, oh, 70 years old. And she went to the mission field for 20 years until she was 90 years old. But before she did that, she was giving. She'd been taught these principles. God will give the money. You just simply give it to Him. When God says, okay, I'm going to do this for you, and He does it, then you give it to Him. And as long as He does that, you just keep giving it to Him. You don't keep it for yourself. And she got that principle. She built a business because of it. She turned off her lights because of it. She didn't eat some days and she would save because of it. Let me ask you a question. When you fast for a day, do you save some money? Can I tell you something? A $2 bag of chips, I can polish that off in 15 minutes. Can I tell you? What is it? 14? 14 bags of chips in 15 minutes? I think I know what you're saying. I think I know what you're saying. But the fact is, a bag of chips, man, I can polish that off in 14 minutes, right? $8 a day. Wow. If you fast two days this week, give $16 to the Lord. Say, well, I think my food would cost more. Well, give more. You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying is there's all kinds of ingenious ways to increase your faith. All kinds of ingenious ways to believe God for money. And then, He may even call you to the mission field at some point. He may even call you to the mission field. Jesus and His disciples, what do you think they did? Well, that common bag that He collected, it was so that they could continue their mission. You think Jesus was a missionary? Yeah, he was the original missionary. People say, Paul was the original. No. Think about this, my friends. Someone once said this. Your pastor is like an eternal home planner. Your pastor is like an eternal home planner. How many of you have your home in heaven? Okay, I thought a whole lot more did. Okay. How many of you have your home in heaven? You know, whenever I do that, it's a sign you're thinking about the ham and cheese sandwich you're going to eat after church. Yeah. Okay, so we're on the same page now. I got your attention. How many of you have your home in heaven? All right, listen to this. Pastors, this, this guy, this is good. This is what he said. Pastors are like eternal home planners. No one has to listen to his advice on investing wisely. And then he just stops the quote. I would have continued with it. But I think it's good that it stops right there. No one needs to listen to his advice on wise planning. You might know everything in the world about how to plan here. Let's just leave it right there. Why don't you have a... Have your heads bowed for just a second. Think through it. Every dollar you give to missions, you think it's going to get wasted? It doesn't matter. It's like when you give money to some homeless guy, and you go, oh, that's not going to be it. God's not going to let that reward go to waste. A cup of cold water given in the name of the Lord. Well, I don't know if it's going to be used. Why? Well, my friends, give it anyway and see that God is going to bless you. Because of your disposition, not necessarily because of what the administration is doing wrong or right. I believe 100% that our church is doing right. I believe that 100% our church, I believe in the deacons and trustees and the way that they do things. They're so humble. They're so broken hearted. They want to be unified. They desire to do what is right. I've seen them do that over and over again. But you and I, are we willing to be the givers? Are we willing to be the prayers? Are we willing to be the goers? Are we willing to do the time? Are we willing to give the attention? Are we willing to have the vision? Are we willing to fast? Are we willing to be in belief of what God can do? Are we willing to have faith in the Savior's way of doing things?
If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I believe in what God is doing. I believe in His way of doing things. And boy, I'll tell you what, this morning, that really helped me. Put your hand up if that really helped you today. Wow. My goodness. Okay, well, I thought it stunk. I I didn't know if I was coming across or not. But the Holy Spirit usually uses the messages I think are the worst because He wants me to realize it's not me. Isn't it terrible that I don't have enough sense to see a good message from the Holy Spirit? Why don't you stand? If you've been touched and you need to come, come. If the Holy Spirit's working on you to be saved, come. If the Holy Spirit's working on you to give more, come. If the Holy Spirit's working on you to pray an extra half hour for mission,